Hi guys, this is Vineet and I welcome you to this video. Today's video topic is primary key and foreign key constraints in SQL Server. Before we proceed ahead, I would request all of you guys to please go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Whosoever has not subscribed yet, please go ahead and subscribe. There's a subscribe button below this video. Click on that subscribe button. Once you click on that subscribe button, it will give you a bell icon. Click on that bell icon, select all notifications to get notifications regarding all my upcoming and future videos. So let me give you five seconds. Please go ahead and subscribe right away. So guys, I hope you must have subscribed by now. So let's come back to today's video and let's move ahead. There are some points to remember while watching this video. Please watch this video till the end to gain better clarity of the concept. If it's possible for you, please watch this video twice or as many times as you like until the concept gets clear to you. Perform any exercises in your test and lab environments only. Do not touch any production environment or production databases for the safety sake. And we would like to know your thoughts regarding our video. So please do share in your uh, comments, feedback and suggestions. We eagerly wait for them and would love to read the same. We have created some playlists for you to watch. Some of our common playlists are SQL Server Database Design, which is uh, currently having more than 108 videos. Uh, apart from that, we have SQL Server Tables, Business Continuity, SQL Server Indexes, SQL Server Performance Tuning, Integration Services, and Project SQL. So these are some of our major SQL Server playlists. And links for all these playlists are uh, given in our video description area. So if you check out the video description area of this video, you will find out links to all of these playlists. And the reason we create playlists for you is because we feel that playlists are best ways to learn instead of watching videos uh, randomly here and there. So if you want to learn about any particular area, for example, if you would like to learn about tables, what we would recommend is please go to the SQL Server tables playlist and watch out all the videos from beginning till the end to gain better clarity in that area. So I hope you got the idea of playlist. And if we talk about the total number of videos posted on our channel, uh, we have more than 250 videos posted on our channel at present and the list is growing uh, at a rapid pace on a daily basis. Uh, I have a channel page link as well. Uh, this link is also available in the video description area of this video. So please check out my channel link page as well, apart from the playlist uh, links. Now let's come back to today's topic. So this topic comes under database design basically and it's related to tables as well. So this video falls under two categories, SQL Server database design and SQL Server tables. So we will talk about the primary key and foreign key constraints. So let me take you to notes quickly and uh, let's go through the notes. So this will be a mix of uh, theoretical and the practical session. Towards the end of the video, we will cover some demos. We have like eight demos, which we need to cover at the end of this video and where we will practically show you how to create the primary keys and uh, foreign keys uh, using the SQL Server Management Studio and Transact SQL. And before that, we need to study some theoretical data. It's better to gain theoretical knowledge uh, before proceeding with any practicals. That's our recommendation is. So let's go through some theory path. And uh, today's topic is primary key and uh, the foreign key constraints. This is today's topic. And primary key and foreign keys are two types of constraints. So these are basically, if we talk about the primary key and the foreign key, these are basically type of constraints. And these constraints can be used to enforce the data integrity in the SQL Server tables. And uh, these are important database objects. So if we talk about the primary key and the foreign key, these are constraints and these are important database uh, objects as well. And basically the purpose of these objects is to enforce the data integrity in SQL Server tables. Now let's talk about the primary key constraints first. And if we talk about the primary key constraints, a table typically has column or combination of columns that contain values that uniquely identify each rows in a table. So if we just focus on this line, so if we look at each and every table, every table has a column or maybe a combination of columns 
that uniquely identifies each uh, row in a table. So, for example, student ID can be one of the columns in the student table which uniquely identify each row in a student table because uh, student ID is unique. And if we talk about this column which uniquely identifies each row in a table or if we talk about the group of columns or combination of columns, this is called the primary key of the table. So, this column or uh, the group of columns which uniquely identifies each row in a table is called the primary key of a table and the role of the primary key is to enforce the data integrity or entity integrity of the table and because the primary key constraints guarantee unique data so the role of this primary key constraint is to guarantee the unique data within the table they are frequently defined on the identity column so generally it is recommended to uh, put the primary key on an identity column. An identity column is something which uh, automatically increments its value whenever the next row is inserted automatically. We don't need to fill out the values in the identity column. So, so they are frequently defined on the identity columns, but it's not necessary. Any other column that uniquely identifies a row in the table can also be used for as a primary key candidate. Now, when you specify a primary key constraint for a table, so whenever we are specifying our primary key constraint for a table, the database engine enforces data uniqueness by automatically creating a unique index for the primary key column. So let's focus on these lines, the first three lines. So whenever we create a primary key constraint on a particular column in a table, the database engine in the background, what it does is, it enforces its uh, data uniqueness by automatically creating a unique index for the primary key column. So, the SQL Server database engine automatically creates an index or a unique index on that particular column uh, on which we are defining the primary key constraint. And uh, this index also permits the fast access to the data uh, in a table. So, the role of index is to basically permit the faster access to data in a table when the primary key column is used in queries all right and if a primary key constraint is uh, defined on more than one column so in case we have uh, selected more than one column to define the primary key constraint the values may be duplicated uh, within one column but each combination of values from all the columns will be unique all right so let me re I to write these sentences again. So in case we define primary key constraint on more than one column, then the values, then uh, we may see that the values are duplicated within one column. But if we take a look at the combination of values of all the columns, it uniquely identifies each row in a table. And uh, the combination of these values must be unique within the table. So, whatever uh, columns we take in the primary key constraint, maybe more than one column, the combination of values in this primary key constraint must be unique or they should be uniquely identifying each row in a table. Now, let's discuss all of this through an example. So, I've taken one table uh, which is showing me a product ID and a vendor ID. There are five columns, product ID, vendor ID, average lead time, standard price and last received cost. So, here the primary key is defined on two columns, uh, which is a combination of product ID and the vendor ID. And in the above table, product ID and vendor ID columns in the, so the table we used is the purchasing dot product vendor table. Um, this should be in the adventure works database, you can check that out. So, in this table, uh, we have defined the primary key on the product and vendor ID columns. And this forms the composite primary key because it is using more than one column. So, this forms a composite primary key constraint for this table. And this basically makes sure that every row in a product vendor table has a unique combination of product ID and vendor ID. So, if we take a look at individual columns, we see that some of the items have repeated. So, if we just take a look at uh, product ID column, so we see that uh, 609 is repeated two times. But if we take a look at combination of columns uh, of a product ID and vendor ID uh, columns, each of the combination is unique. 
So that's why we have created a composite primary key on both the product ID and vendor ID column. And basically this uh, prevents the insertion of the duplicate rows. So, so duplicate rows will not be inserted uh, once we define the primary key properly. And uh, a table can only have one primary key constant. So these are some of the important points which we need to remember. So if we take a uh, look at table, a table can only have one primary key constant, not more than one. And primary key can't exceed 16 columns. So as we already discussed that uh, multiple columns can also be included in a primary key constant. So we cannot include more than 16 columns. And the total key length should not exceed the 900 bytes limit. So that, that are some of the restrictions. And the index generated by the primary key constant. So we talked about this and uh, we talked that the SQL Server Management Studio, SQL Server Database Engine, uh, to be precise, creates a index in the background or a unique index in the background whenever we define a primary key constant on a particular column. So this index generated by the primary key, primary key constraints can't cause the number of indexes on the table to exceed 999 non-trusted indexes. So there's a limit on the indexes that we define on the table. So we cannot create more than 999 non-cluster indexes on a table. And similarly for cluster indexes, we cannot uh, create more than one cluster index on the table. All right, so your primary key which in turn uh, enforces the creation of index should not uh, cross these uh, limits uh, in case uh, we are creating a non-cluster index or a cluster index uh, via the primary key. So still we have a restriction of 999 non-cluster indexes and one cluster index. Now if clustered or non-clustered isn't specified for a primary key constant, so Whenever we are defining a primary key constant while uh, creating the table and we do not define the uh, index type, uh, what type of index will be created, uh, normally the clustered is used. So by default, a cluster index gets created whenever we define a primary key constant on a particular column, unless we specifically specify that uh, we need a non-cluster index in the background. So otherwise, a clustered index is used if there is no clustered index on the table. So in case the cluster index is already present on the table, only the non-cluster index will get created by default. Otherwise, if cluster index is not present in a table, um, defining the primary key constant will create a cluster index. So guys, if you don't have any idea about the indexes, what are cluster indexes, what are non-cluster indexes, I have a playlist. Uh, the link is given in the description. So the playlist name is uh, SQL Server indexes, you can check that out. Uh, this will provide you much more information on indexes, including uh, non clustered and cluster indexes. Now, next point is all columns defined within the primary key constraint must be defined as not null. So, uh, any of the columns that uh, we are taking as a part of primary key constraint, uh, we should uh, explicitly specify not null against them because uh, those value uh, and those columns cannot contain any null values. And uh, by chance, if we do not define any nullability for the column, all columns participating in the primary key constant have their nullability set to not null. So this is a default thing. If we do not uh, explicitly specify that uh, these uh, columns which are taking part in the primary key or on which the primary key is being defined, if we don't define them as not null, then the system automatically take them as not null. Now, if a primary key is defined on the CLR use user defined data types so these are one of the user defined data types uh, so far we haven't talked about them and uh, we will create some more videos on that what is a clr uh, user defined type column so if we define a primary key on such a type of column the implementation of the type must must support the so the implementation of this type the clr user defined type must uh, support the binary ordering in case we want to define the primary key on these type of columns now let's talk about the foreign key constraints what they are so far we have talked about the primary key constraint which basically uh, specifies the uniqueness of the row within the table let's see what's the role of foreign key constraints uh, 
ओके गाइस लेट्स कंटिन्यू विद द फॉरेन की कांस्टेंट्स सो फॉरेन की और एफ के इज अ कॉलम और कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ कॉलम्स सो सिमिलर टू प्राइमरी की द फॉरेन की कैन आल्सो बी डिफाइंड ऑन अ सिंगल कॉलम और अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ कॉलम्स एज़ वेल दैट इज यूज्ड टू एस्टैब्लिश एंड एनफोर्स अ लिंक बिटवीन द डेटा इन टू टेबल्स सो द रोल ऑफ फॉरेन की इज टू एनफोर्स अ लिंक बिटवीन द डेटा इन द टू टेबल्स सो इट एनफोर्सेस द link between two tables the data and the two tables to control the data that can be stored in a foreign key table let me take you through these three lines again so we create a foreign key on a single column or a combination of columns and basically foreign key is used to establish and enforce a link between the data in the two tables to control the data that can be stored in the foreign key table so you may read this definition again to get better clarity Now, in a foreign key reference, a link is created between the two tables. So, whenever we create a foreign key, it creates a link between the two tables. When a column, a combination of columns that hold the primary key value for one table are referenced by the column or columns in another table. So, basically, how a foreign key is created? So, a foreign key reference is created. whenever a foreign key reference is created a link is created between the two tables so one table is holding the primary key uh, in those two tables and there are other columns that is referencing that primary key in the secondary table so a link is created between two tables when a column or columns that hold the primary key value for one table and this uh, uh, primary key column is referenced by the column or columns in another table and these columns bec becomes the foreign key in the second table so primary key of one table becomes the foreign key in another table and uh, there's a link created between the columns uh, the primary key columns and the secondary key columns a link is created between uh, these columns in different tables specifically two tables all right and uh, if you take an example There's a table in the AdventureWorks 2022 database, uh, which is a sales dot sales order header table. So this is the table that has the foreign key link to the sales dot salesperson table, because there's a logical relationship between the sales order and salespeople table. All right, the salesperson ID column in the sales order header table matches the primary key column of the salesperson table. All right, so let me show you uh, these tables. If I take you to SQL Server, let me show this to you practically. So I've just invoked SQL Server. It will take a minute to launch. So here the primary key is salesperson ID. Let me show that to you. Okay, the SQL Server is up and running. Let me connect to the default uh, local instance, and uh, let me expand on the AdventureWorks database. So in my system, it's renamed to my Adventure Works. In your system, it should be uh, as Adventure Works 2022. If you have not installed it, please install it from the Microsoft website. You can download it and install it. Now let's take a look at table. So what was the table? Let's quickly take a look at notes. So there are two tables involved: salesperson and sales dot sales order header. So first, take a look at salesperson table. The table name is sales dot salesperson. So this is the table. So if we take a look at the structure of the table, and if we take a look at the columns. so there is no column like salesperson id but instead we have uh, business entity id and territory id so in this table the business entity id is the primary key so the example given here in the notes uh, does not exactly match the table structures uh, in the system so let me define it generally as they are not matching with the sql server so here two tables are involved let me uh, mark it with a different color so if we take a look at this table sales dot sales order header table and second table is sales dot sales person tables now we have a column uh, the column name is sales person id so this column in the sales order header table matches the primary key column of the sales person table the sales person id column in the sales person header table is the foreign key to the sales person table uh, let me also take a look at uh, sales person header table let's see So the table name is sales order header. Okay. So this is the table. Let's check the structure of this. So 
So if we take a look at this uh, table, we see that uh, salesperson ID is the foreign key uh, used within this table. And this uh, column should be the primary key in some other table. So let's see uh, what columns it is mapping to. So if we modify the, uh, take a look at properties of this foreign key, which column does it refer to in which table? We get an idea from here. So from here, we are not getting any idea right so we know that this is the foreign key um, but we don't know what it references which column it references so if we click on modify let's see what do we get so we got this uh, design view so the column in question is the salesperson id and if we take a look at the bottom part let's see what table does it refer to so it is uh, showing in the description that uh, this refers to a salesperson who created the sales order and it's a foreign key to the salesperson dot business entity id so this is the column which is being referenced as salesperson id as the foreign key in this table so business entity id in that particular table is the primary key in the salesperson table so this is the primary key and this primary key is referred to as uh, salesperson id in the sales dot sales order header table and here it's a foreign key and uh, here it is indicated although it's a primary key but it is uh, referenced as foreign key in another table so this is indicated by pk comma fk and uh, the table where it's just a foreign key uh, it is indicated by fk um, this is a foreign key and the description is given over here and we can uh, check through the description there is a though the description is uh, written otherwise it was not possible for us to determine uh, which column does it reference we will show you later on how to determine that there should be a way to determine that uh, which column does it reference how about the definition says to us that it referenced the business entity id column we talked that the salesperson id column in the sales order header table matches the primary key column of the salesperson table and that primary key column is the business entity id column the salesperson id column in the salesperson header table is the foreign key to the salesperson table all right so salesperson id is the foreign key to the salesperson table and this salesperson table contains the business entity id column uh, which is a primary key for that table which is, and this primary key is referenced as foreign key by the name of salesperson id in the sales order header table now by creating the foreign key relationship a value for the salesperson id cannot be inserted into the sales order table if if it does not have a matching row in the salesperson table so this is one of the important points so whenever we create this foreign key relationship uh, between these two tables we cannot then insert a row into the sales order header table with the salesperson id that is not matching in the salesperson table so that is basically the referential integrity enforced by the foreign key now if we talk about the table it can reference maximum of uh, 253 other tables so this is one of the restrictions so a table can only reference maximum of 253 columns uh, from other tables or 253 other tables a table can link to only 253 other tables and columns as a foreign keys uh, which are also known as outgoing references so foreign keys are also known as the outgoing references all right and a table can maximum uh, refer to another 253 tables or columns that is also one of the important points now if we talk about sql server 2016 it increased the limit of number of other tables and columns that can reference column in a single table incoming references from 253 to 10000 so with sql server 2016 uh, the limit is increased to 10000 from 253 and this require at least uh, 130 130 compatibility level which is for sql server 2016 now uh, with this increase uh, which is introduced by sql server 2016 we have some restrictions as well so greater than 253 foreign key references are only supported for delete dml operations so in case we have more than 253 foreign key references and basically more than 253 references are only supported for any delete operations and if we talk about the update and merge operations uh, these are not supported in case the table has more than 
253 foreign key references now a table with the foreign key reference to itself so sometimes we use the columns from the same table as a foreign key reference to itself it is still limited to 253 foreign key references so even though we use the foreign key reference from the same table within the same table the restriction still applies uh, we cannot have more than uh, 253 uh, foreign key references now greater than 253 foreign key references aren't currently available for column store indexes or uh, memory optimized tables as well or for stretch databases or for partition foreign key tables so for these uh, type of uh, items we don't support uh, more than 253 foreign key references now the stretch database feature is now deprecated in the sql server 2022 and the azure sql databases and this feature will be removed in the future version of database engine as well so we recommend you to avoid using this feature for any new development work and uh, plan to modify the application that currently use this feature now let's talk about the indexes on the foreign key constraints or the foreign key columns now unlike the primary key constraints uh, where the index gets automatically created in the background Creating a foreign key constraint doesn't automatically create a corresponding index. So index is not created automatically whenever we define a foreign key constraint. However, manually, uh, however, manually creating an index on a foreign key column is often useful for the following reasons. So there are benefits uh, in creating an index on the foreign key column. So of, let's discuss some of these benefits. So foreign key columns are frequently used in join criteria. So Sometimes we need to fetch data from two tables by using the join criteria. So during those join criteria, generally the join is made on the foreign key column. And uh, when the data from related table is combined in queries by matching the columns or columns in the foreign key constraint of the one table with the primary key or unique column or columns in another table. So when a join is made between the primary key column and the foreign key column to get the data out, an index is useful in those situations so let's see so if we have an index on the foreign key column in those situations that index enables the database engine to quickly find the related data in the foreign key table all right so an index basically provides faster performance in terms of uh, fetching or finding data quickly in the foreign key table however creating this index is not required so Creating an index on the foreign key is not generally required, but yeah, we can create it for any performance benefits. Data from two related tables can be combined even no primary key or foreign key uh, relationship is there. Uh, we can still combine the columns from two tables to fetch the data if they contain the same type of data, even though the primary key or uh, foreign key constraints are not defined between the tables. But a foreign key relationship between two tables indicates that two tables have been optimized to be combined in a query that uses the keys as a criteria. So generally, foreign key specifies uh, that we can join two tables between primary uh, and we can use the primary key and foreign key uh, in the other table to make it that join to fetch out the data to get the combined data from two tables. Let's see the another benefit of creating the index on the foreign key column. So the changes to a primary key constraints are checked with the foreign key constraints in related table. So this is another point. So whenever uh, we make a change to a primary key constraints, they are checked with foreign key constraints in related tables using that index. Now let's talk about the referential integrity which is provided by the foreign keys. So the role of foreign keys is to provide the referential integrity. Although the main purpose of foreign key constraint is to control the data that can be stored in the foreign key tables so what's the main purpose of foreign key the purpose is to basically control the data that can be stored in the foreign key table another purpose is that it also control changes to the data in the primary key table so the foreign key also controls the changes to the data in the primary key table to which it is linked for example if we take if a row in salesperson let me mark it with different color so if a row in the salesperson or if a row for a salesperson is deleted from the sales.salesperson table, so we are taking a, a scenario where a row for a particular salesperson is deleted from sales.salesperson table, and the salesperson's ID is used for sales orders in the sales order header table. 
So whatever row we are deleting from the sales dot sales person table, the, uh, if it has a reference in the other table, uh, sales dot sales or the header, the relation integrity between the two tables is broken. So if we don't have a foreign key uh, relationship established between these two tables, so whenever we uh, delete any row from a salesperson table and uh, that uh, salesperson is being used, uh, ID is being used in the sales order header table. So in those cases where the foreign key is not defined, the relationship or uh, the relational integrity between the two table gets broken. So in case of foreign key is absent, the relationship integrity or relational integrity between the two table is broken. The deleted salesperson sales order are orphaned in the sales order header table. So this is what it will cause in case of absence of foreign key. So in case the foreign key or a relationship is not there between the two tables using the primary key and foreign key constants. So whenever we delete a row from one table and if that in this case, if, if we uh, delete a row from the for a salesperson from the sales dot salesperson table, and uh, if that salesperson have any uh, associated records in the sales order header table, those records will not get deleted automatically. Records still exist in the sales order header table, and this will be called the orphan records in the sales order header table without a link to the data in the salesperson table. So the link is broken here. These records in the sales order header table will not have a link to the records in the salesperson table because we do not have any foreign key constant defined between the two tables. Now, what, what is the benefit of uh, using the foreign key constant? So a foreign key basically prevents this situation. So this is one of the important points. A foreign key basically prevents this situation where we have our fund records in another table. The constraint, so if we create a foreign key constraint, this constraint enforces referential integrity by guaranteeing that changes can't be made to data in the primary key table if those changes invalidate the link to a data in the foreign key table. So this is guys one of the very important points uh, to read through. So basically the presence of foreign key constraint basically ensures or guarantees that changes cannot be made to the data in the primary key table if those changes invalidate the link to the data in the foreign key table so primary key uh, the foreign key enforces the referential integrity if it is present now if an attempt is made to delete the row in the primary key table so if we make any attempt to delete the data from the or a row from the primary key table or to change the if we try to change the primary key value the action will fail all right so the data from the primary key table cannot be deleted if the foreign key is present uh, and uh, if we have associated records in the secondary table for that particular primary key in the primary key table. Now if an attempt is made to delete a row in the primary key table or if we try to change the primary key value, the action will fail when the deleted or changed primary key value corresponds to a value in the foreign key constraint of another table. So if we, if we have associated data present in the foreign key table, uh, we cannot delete the associated data in the primary key table and we cannot uh, change the primary key value as well. So this um, this is one of the important statements. Please go through it. And to successfully delete or change the row in a foreign key constraint, you must first either the delete the foreign key data in the foreign key table. So one solution to this is, so this is the solution we are providing to uh, this situation. So in order to delete such data, First, we need to delete it, uh, delete that data from the foreign key table before we can delete the data from the primary key table. So that can be done. So this is also another important point. Please go through it. So let me reiterate it. To successfully delete or change a row in the foreign key constraint, a foreign key table, we must first delete the data from the foreign key table first, and then we can delete the data from the primary key table. This can be done. But the other way around we cannot do, we cannot first delete the data from the primary key table if it has associated data in the foreign key table. Now let's talk about the cascading referential integrity. So this is another item. Let's talk about the cascading referential integrity. Now whenever we use the cascading referential integrity constraint, you can define the actions that the database engine will take 
then the user tries to delete or update the data in the primary key table or the data which has an existing foreign key points. The following cascading actions can be defined. So we can define certain cascading actions in, in case we want to delete the data directly from the primary key table that has uh, associated records in the foreign key table. So first action is the no action. So if no action is defined under the cascading options, the database engine will simply raise an error and the delete or update action on the row in the parent table is rolled back. So we cannot delete uh, a row from the parent table or the primary key table in case uh, we define no action for the cascading actions. Second option is the cascade for the cascading action. So whenever we delete a row from the primary key table, corresponding rows are updated or deleted in the secondary key, uh, secondary key or uh, foreign key table as well. So whenever a row is deleted from a primary key table and if that record has uh, associated records in the foreign key table, corresponding rows are updated or deleted in the referencing table when the row are updated or deleted in the primary table or the parent table. Now cascade cannot be specified if a timestamp column is part of either the foreign key or the reference key. So cascading cannot be performed if we have a column uh, which is of timestamp type and if it's a part of foreign key or the reference key in those cases cascading cannot be performed and on delete cascade cannot be specified for a table that has an instead of delete trigger so these operations cannot be defined on delete cascade we cannot uh, define this uh, cascading option for a table that has instead of delete trigger and uh, similarly, we cannot define the on update cascade for the tables that have instead of update triggers. So these are some of the restrictions. Another option is set null for the cascading operation. So in this operations, all the values that make up the foreign key are set to null, or all the records or values uh, in the foreign key table are set to null whenever whenever we delete a row from a primary key table all the values that make up the foreign key are set to null when the corresponding row in the parent table is updated or deleted so whenever we perform the update or delete operation in a primary key table all the corresponding foreign key values in the foreign key table will get set to null and for this constraint to execute uh, the foreign key columns must be nullable in order to set this option we must make sure that uh, your foreign key columns uh, can contain null values they should not be set to not null and cannot be specified for tables that have instead of update triggers so again we cannot specify these options for any tables that have instead of update triggers now in a, the last option for cascading operation is the set default basically to set the defaults in the for the foreign key uh, values whenever a delete or update uh, operation is performed in the table with the primary key so all the values that make up the foreign key are set to their default values if the corresponding row in the parent table or the primary key table are updated or deleted. And for this constraint to execute, all the foreign key columns must be must have the default definitions. So all your foreign key columns must have default definition in case you want to set the set default option for the cascading operation. If a column is nullable and there is no explicit default value set null becomes the implicit default value of the column and this cannot be specified for the tables that have instead of update triggers so again th this is the restriction and this value cannot be specified for tables on which the instead of update trigger is defined now cascade set null set default and no action these four options cannot be combined on tables that have referential relationship with each other so these cannot be combined these options cannot be combined where we have referential relationship between two tables the if the database engine encounters no action it stops and rolls that related cascade set null and set default actions statement causes a combination of cascade set null set default and no actions all the cascade set null and set default actions are applied before the database engine checks for any no action so it applies no actions last so if we define a combination of actions it will perform the no action as the last attempt all right
Now let's talk about triggers and cascading relationship between the triggers and cascading referential actions. Uh, we talked about some of the cascading referential actions uh, above, which are no action, cascade, uh, set null, and set defaults. So let's uh, find out the relationship between the triggers. There are certain type of triggers and the cascading referential actions, which we discussed above. Let's see how they are related. So there are some points to go through. After that, we will move on to practicals. So cascading referential actions fire the after update and after delete triggers. So whenever we perform the cascading referential actions, they can fire the after update and after delete triggers. So we will make a series of videos on triggers as well. So for now, just understand that uh, any trigger that's executed uh, after the update to a row in a table are called after update triggers and any uh, triggers that get executed after a row is deleted from a table are called after delete triggers. So these cascading referential actions can either update a row in a table or delete a row from the foreign key table. And uh, this operation in turn triggers the after update and after delete triggers in the foreign key table in the following manner. All the cascading referential actions directly caused by the original delete or update are performed first. So all these cascading referential actions get performed first before the trigger gets executed. So this is one of the uh, first point. And if there are any after triggers defined on the affected tables, so if we have any after triggers defined on that uh, foreign key table or affected table, these trigger fire after all cascading actions are performed. So all the rows get deleted or updated after that operation is done, the after triggers get executed on that table. Now these triggers fire in opposite order of the cascading action. If there are multiple triggers on a single table, they fire in random order. So if we have trigger defined, they fired in opposite uh, order of the cascading action. And in case we have multiple triggers defined on the single table, they fire in random order, unless there is a dedicated first or last trigger for that table. The order is as specified by using the SP set trigger order. If multiple cascading chains originate from a table that was the direct target of an update or delete actions. So here we are talking uh, about a table with a primary key constraint. If the result of a update or delete operation on a primary key table results in multiple cascading chains originate from that table, the order in which the chains fire uh, the respective trigger is unspecified. However, one chain always fires all its triggers before another chain starts firing. If after trigger on a table, so if we have an after trigger on the table that is the direct track target of an update or delete action fires, regardless of whether any rows are affected, there are no other tables affected by cascading in this case. So if we have an after trigger defined on a table, that is the direct target of the update or delete action fires regardless of whether any rows are affected. There are no other tables affected by cascading in this case. So in case there are no cascading operations or basically uh, if we have a after trigger defined on the foreign key table, which is a direct target of the update or delete uh, operation in a primary key table. And if that uh, after trigger fires, regardless of whether any rows are affected or not, there are no other tables affected by cascading in this case. Now, if any of the previous triggers perform update or delete operations on another table, so in case the result of trigger is to perform the update and delete on delete operations on another table, this section can start secondary cascading chains. So if the role is uh, of the after trigger is to perform any update and delete operation on another tables, these sections can start the secondary cascading chains. The secondary chains are processed for each update and delete operation. Mm -hmm. At the time, all the triggers on the primary chains fire. So basically the processing order is the secondary chains are processed for each update and delete operation at the time after all the triggers on the primary chain will fire. This process can be recursively repeated for subsequent update or delete operations. Three more points left, guys. <laughs> Uh, I know it's getting boring, but yeah, uh, it's better to go through the theory, but after that, uh, we will start off the practicals. Now, performing a create, alter, delete, or 
any other data definition language operation and CIDR trigger can cause TDL triggers to fire. This might subsequently perform delete and update operations that start additional cascading chains and triggers. Now, if an error is generated inside any particular referential action chain, so here we're talking about the multiple uh, cascading chains. So if an error is encountered within any of the action chain, an error is raised and no after triggers are fired in that chain and the delete or update operation that created the chain is rolled back. Now a table has an instead of trigger. So here we are talking about the table that has an instead of trigger. This is one of one of the types of trigger. Can't also have a references clause. So if a table has this trigger, we cannot have references clause uh, that specified the cascading action. So this is our restriction here. If a table has an instead of trigger, it cannot have a references clause that uh, specified a cascading action. However, an after trigger on the table targeted by the cascading action can execute an insert update or delete statement on another table or view that fires the instead of trigger defined on that object. So this is also one of the important points to remember. Now let me take you through some of the demos. Uh, I will take you through all of these demos. So first let's talk about uh, creating primary keys uh, using the SQL Server Management Studio and basically you can define primary key on the SQL Server database engine by using the SQL Server Management Studio or Transact SQL. Both ways can be opted. Creating a primary key basically automatically creates a corresponding unique cluster index in the background. Uh, this we already talked about. However, your primary key can be specified as non-cluster index instead. So by default it creates creation of primary key creates the cluster index but yeah we can definitely specify it to create the non-cluster index and in this example we will use the adventure works to run 22 database as a sample database now let me take you through sql server management studio let's go into that let's use this uh, database so basically here i'm just defining the way to define a primary key constraint on a particular table so in the object explorer we are currently connected to a database and in my system the adventure works 22 database is renamed as uh, my adventure works database now i'm uh, giving you the way to create a primary key constraint on the table on which you define want to define the primary key constraint you need to expand the table section and for example here is a test table and uh, if we take a look at this table this table has only c1 and c2 columns right and we see the values in c2 columns are different however we see repeated uh, values in the c1 column so c2 column is an ideal column for a primary key in this table if i would say so if you want to make the c2 column as the primary key in this table what we can do is we can right click on that table on which you want to add the unique constraint and you need to go into the design view so click on design so it will open up a table designer and uh, we need to select a row so here we want to define the primary key constraint on the c2 column so select the row selector for a database column for which you want to define uh, which you want to define as the primary key if you want to select multiple columns you can hold down the control key to select the multiple columns but here we want to find the primary key on just one column itself otherwise if you want to define primary key in multiple column we can hold down the control key to select multiple columns or multiple rows indicating columns now right click the row selector so if we right click on it there's an option set primary key so we can select that option for ct column to become the primary key so I've set the C2 column as primary key indicated by this key icon. Now there's a word of caution. If you want, uh, if you want to redefine the primary key, any relationships to the existing primary key must first be deleted before the new primary key can be created. So if we have any foreign key relationships uh, that are referencing this uh, primary key that we have just created, so far we don't have any. But if we want to change the primary key. And if we have a uh, foreign key relationships to the existing primary key, those foreign key relationship must be deleted before the new primary key can be created. 
and a message will appear warning you that existing relationship will automatically be deleted as a part of the that process so that is fine so here we we don't have any foreign key relationships and we are just creating a brand new primary key column now a primary key column is identified by the primary key symbol in the row key selector uh, this is the symbol of a key indicating that this column is a primary key now if a primary key consists of more than one column duplicate values are allowed in one column but each combination of values from all the columns in the primary key must be unique we have already discussed this point now if we have a compound key which consists of more than one columns the order of columns in the primary key matches the order of columns in in the shown table okay i think for uh, now this much is fine so you need to right click and select the make primary key all right or set primary key is the option you get so right now it is showing me the remove primary key i don't want to remove it i want to set this column as a primary key so once you do that you can close this out and uh, save the changes to the table so a primary key column is created and if we expand the table if we take a look at columns now we can see that c2 column is a primary key column and it cannot be null so not null is attached to this column all right so we are done with the first demo uh, here i have shown you how you can uh, create primary key using the sql server management studio now let me take you through some of the other practicals so here i will use the transact sql so i will show you how to create a primary key in an existing table using the transact sql so let's go back to sql server let's create a new query so in this query what we will do we will use the following table so let's take production dot transaction history archive let's take this table so let's see if it has any key columns so it all already has a primary key defined on the transaction id column basically i can uh, recreate the primary key on the same column so let me show you statements to do that so this is a demo on how you can create a primary key in an existing table but in this table already a primary key is there so we can alter and just define the same column as the primary key we cannot change that so the syntax for doing that is the you need to alter the table as we are modifying an existing table and the table name is the transaction let me turn on the intelligence list members let's see so the table is transaction history archive the table we are modifying let's start the bracket let's end the bracket so under that let's modify the transaction id column which is already the primary key so transaction id column we are modifying we are defining it as same type in type uh, it's an identity column and it's not null and let's define a constraint so the key is already with the name uh, we take a look at the key so key name is this uh, let me let me change the key name a uh, little bit copy this stuff let's add a constraint let's make it one let, to see if it works let's make this constraint as a primary key i'm adding a, another constraint uh, it's a primary key let's define clustered so that it should create cluster index and uh, this constraint is defined on the transaction id column so if we take a look at key it is uh, defined on the transaction id column already let's try uh, let's see let's try to execute this statement to see if it that works or not uh, let's give the complete reference uh, to the table so it's production dot uh, and basically we uh, let's modify it properly so here we are just modifying the table and let's remove some of the items here so here we are creating a primary key in an existing table so we are altering this table we are just adding a constraint so just remove this stuff just do an add constraint statement and use the same constraint as it is already there with the same name and make it primary key clustered on the transaction id column so we can do this our primary key is already created on that column and we are just modifying and again creating the primary key on the same column so we can do that.
so we cannot do that you see the messages it is saying that table this already has a primary key defined in it so we cannot create this constant so as the primary key is already defined and this constant is already defined we cannot uh, recreate this constant but in case uh, this was not present or this primary key was not present we could have created this primary key by using this uh, ultra table statement maybe we can try to see if we can uh, go to the design mode of table to remove the primary key and again create that let's go to the design and see if it gives us any error messages so this is the primary key let's remove this primary key and uh, save the table let's see if we get any warning messages if it has any foreign key records in another table it should give us any warning messages so it hasn't given us any warning messages and we have removed the primary key and if we refresh the columns here uh, we see that primary key is removed although the constant is there constraint can also be removed we can right click here and delete the constraint let's create it again after deleting it so you see we cannot uh, we cannot delete this constraint So it is saying that the subject does not exist on the server. So we need to refresh the keys as well. So removing the primary key from a column uh, deletes its, its associated constraint as well. So if we refresh here, we see that keys are no longer present. So we can execute this statement now to create a fresh uh, primary key. The syntax is we alter table, give the table name, we define the add constraint uh, syntax. And we this we can only do if the primary key is not already created on a table. So we do an add constraint, add the name of the constraint, and we define some meaningful name. Uh, we are creating a primary key constraint on the transaction history archive table, and the column we are using is transaction ID column. After that, we define the keyword. We define that the clustered index should be created in the background on the transaction ID column. So this is the statement we need to execute. So we have executed the statement. Now we can see that uh, transaction ID column will have uh, the primary key defined on it. We can refresh it. So we have a primary key, and if we refresh the keys column, we will see that uh, this constraint is also created over here. So if we expand the keys, we'll see this constraint. All right, guys. So we are done with this practical. Let's move on to next practical. In this practical, we will create a primary key in a brand new table. So let's create a new table. And this table name will be transaction history archive one. I'm creating a brand uh, brand new table altogether. So this new table name will be transaction history archive one. So let's begin with the create table statement. We are creating a brand new table, and the table name will be production dot transaction history archive archive, and let's name it one to be a new table let's define the structure of the table in this table we are creating a transaction id column just a transaction id column no other columns this will be of integer type and this will be an identity column starting with one and seeding with one so the value will start at one for next row it will be two and this will be a not null column and uh, let's define a constraint on this column let's take the constraint name uh, similar to this one but we will just add one next to it so i'm uh, taking a constant name as this we can even uh, copy copy the name from here so let's add this constraint just put one next to it or maybe put one here all right and after adding this constraint you need to specify this as a primary key this constraint will be a primary key and it will create a cluster index in the background on the transaction id column so this is a brand new table altogether this is not an existing table so the new table is transaction history archive one and in this table we have added one column and we have added a constraint on that particular column and we have defined a constraint name we have defined it as a, as a primary key constraint and we have also defined that it should create a cluster index in the background on the transaction id column let's execute this statement so we see that a new table is created so we can uh, refresh the table section to see that table so refresh the table section so once it refreshes it will show us the table so table name is uh, production dot uh, transaction history archive 
one this is the brand new table we have created with a single column and this column is a primary key and the constraint name is this right so this is how you create a define a primary key whenever you are creating a new table now let me take you to next practical where we will create a non-clustered primary key so far we have created a primary key uh, where we will create a cluster index in the background now we'll show you how you can create a non-clustered primary key with separate cluster index in a new table so in this case primary key will not be defined on the column with the cluster index but uh, it will be defined on the column with a non-cluster index so let me remove this code so let's create a brand new table and add a cluster index to it so i'm creating a new table altogether so let's remove this table transaction history archive one right we'll create it again so let's delete this table altogether so this table is deleted the transaction history archive uh, one table is deleted let me recreate that table so let me mention that table name after the create table statement it's production dot uh, transaction history archive and one attached to it let's define the table structure and this table structure we are defining some columns let's create customer id as the first column and uh, this will be a unique identifier type column identifier this is a type unique identifier we will talk about this type later and the default value for this column will be the new sequential id and this is a function basically sequential id is the function so this will take values through this function let's take another column which is a transaction id and this will be int column of identity type starting with values one and seeding by one and this will be a nominal column all right and let's create a constraint here which will be a primary key constraint so define the keyword constraint let's take the constraint name as pk underscore transaction history archive one underscore customer id so this will be a primary key and let's create a non cluster index on the customer id column so here we have defined two column customer id and transaction id however we have created a constraint a primary key constraint on the customer id column which is of unique identifier type and uh, it takes the default values um, using the new sequential id function if you don't specify anything for the customer id it automatically takes the value from new sequential id function and we have created a constraint on this customer id column the name of the constraint is this this is a primary key constraint and in the background i've specified it should create a non-cluster index on the customer id column all right and let's execute this statement and after executing this statement a non-cluster index gets created on this table now let's execute it let's refresh the table section to see if it is created uh, that table so let's take a look at table the table name should be production dot transaction history archive one so in this case we have created a non-cluster index so let's take a look at columns so we have a primary key defined on the customer id column which is of unique identifier type and if we take a look at keys this key key name is created right and but if we take a look at indexes we see that it has created this index it's a non-cluster index it has created the index with the same name right as the constraint and this index is non-clustered right so this is how you specify a non-cluster index for our primary key column now let me add a new cluster index to this table i'm just adding a cluster index however the primary key is defined on the non-cluster index but i'm still adding a cluster index to this table so let's create a create let's create a cluster index using the create clustered index statement let's name it cax underscore transaction id 
I'm defending it on the second column because on the first column customer ID, a non-clustered uh, primary key index is there. So I'm creating a index on the other column, which is transaction ID. So I'm using the create cluster index statement. The name of index is CX underscore uh, transaction ID. And we are creating this on the columns. Uh, I need to specify the table name and the column name. So we are creating this on the production dot transaction history archive archive table. And uh, we need to specify the column. So we are creating it on the transaction ID column. So I've specified that. I don't know why it is uh, showing the red bar under that, but it should be okay. Let's execute it. So, okay, so the table here is transaction history archive one on which we have to create a cluster index, not the transaction history archive, which is already there. So we need to create a cluster index on transaction history archive. Let's execute this statement. So a cluster index is now created. We can refresh this table to check out the items. Now we see we have columns, customer ID. It has a, it is a primary key column and a transaction ID on which no key is defined. Let's take a look at keys. So we only have one key defined on that customer ID column. But if we take a look at indexes, now we have two indexes. So CX underscore transaction ID is the cluster index, which is created on the transaction ID column. Whereas this index is created on the customer ID column. All right. So this is how you add a cluster index to a table, which already has a primary key defined on the column, which has a non cluster index on it. All right, we are done with this practical guys. And let's see what the, the demos do we have. Other demos are so far we are done till demo four. Now let me show you how you can modify your primary key. Let's go to the next practical how you can modify your primary key using the SQL Server Management Studio. All right. So to modify your primary key, right? What you need to do is you need to open a let me close this all together. I don't want to save it. Let's close this as well. So this is the table we are working with here. So we need to open the table designer uh, table in a designer mode. So once we open the table designer in the designer mode, we see that our primary key is already created on the customer ID column. So basically first we open the table in the designer mode for which you want to modify the primary key. Now, right click in the table designer window. Uh, in order to modify, what you can do is right click on the table designer window. And there's an option called index keys here. So you can select that. It will show us all the index and keys present uh, on this table. So we need to select the primary key from the selected primary unique key index list. From this list, we should select the primary key and we can complete the following actions we can uh, rename the primary key so we can change the name of the primary key from here so here the name of the primary key is cx underscore transaction id but this is the cluster index so primary key is this we can change the name of the key from here right you can type the new name for that primary key in that box so let's make it archive two. Let's make it archive two instead of archive one. So type the new name in the name box and make sure that your new name does not duplicate a name in the selected uh, primary unique key index list. So this is fine. So after changing the name, you just uh, close it. Now the under the key section, you will see a different name. So for in order to for changes to take effect, you need to save the table so click on the save button here so it is indicating me some warnings that are so i've changed the name of this key let's see let's save it yes let's do yes for now so i've saved the table let's see I refresh the key section to see if the key name is modified so yeah a key name is modified all right 
so this is how you modify the keys you can set the clustering uh, clustering options as well so if you go to the index keys options you can select that uh, index and right now a non uh, created on this primary key column right and you can change the index type so to create a cluster index for the primary key select create as cluster so this can be set to yes in case no no already clustered uh, index is present on the system in our case we have cx transaction id uh, cluster index present so let me delete that index first so if you go to indexes let me uh, remove this cluster index so let's do it is not even allowing me to delete the cluster index on that column yeah now it is so let me delete that cluster index so now the cluster index uh, cx transaction id is being deleted now it's deleted now let's go to the table designer view let's go to the design view and let's go to the index keys options here we only have one index and so far it is uh, the non cluster index so if we want to create it as clustered we need to use the yes option to make it clustered so after selecting yes just click close and save the table so click on yes whatever warning you are getting now the index is being changed to the cluster index let's refresh the indexes section to see if it is clustered now so we see that this uh, index is now changed to clustered instead of uh, non-clustered earlier it was non-clustered so this is uh, how you set the clustered option now we can also define a fill factor strategy in that view so let's go to index keys so there is a section called the fill specifications strategy and uh, you need to expand the fill specification category and type the integer from 0 to 100 in the fill factor box but here we don't want to define the fill factor but you can do it here so this is basically the fill factor for the index that we have created how much the base, uh, how much uh, percentage of pages must be filled so we can set it to 80 if we want uh, a page to be 80 percent filled before a new page is created for the index so we can specify the fill factor for index over here earlier we had talked about the fill factors for indexes you can watch out my indexes videos where we have defined about the uh, talked about the fill factor for index you can check out that to get more details but yeah you can change the fill factor from here now we can change the column order as well so let's see uh, here we have only couple of columns so here we have only primary key defined on the first column so otherwise if we have primary key defined on the multiple columns then the column order is specified over here but here in our scenario we only have one column on which the primary key is defined but in case we have multiple columns we can change the order from here so we can change the column order we can make columns up and down we can change the sorting order for all that particular columns what should be the sorting order for the indexing purpose we can make it descending ascending we can specify the sorting order from here and we can change the column ordering as well we have multiple uh, columns available but here we only have uh, one column so we can define the sort order for that column so for each individual column we can define the sort order but here we can change the order of columns as well we can specify uh, the columns and sort order for the index for each column so we have changed it to descending and let's save that so the sorting uh, column is now changed sorting order is now changed for that particular index all right we are done with this practical as well now if you want to change the primary key constraint using the transact sql the way is to do uh, the way to do that is you must first delete the existing primary key constraint and then recreate it with the new definition you cannot modify like this what you are doing with the table designer view 
if you want to do the same with the transact sql what you need to do you need to drop the or delete the existing uh, primary key constant and then you need to define a new one let's move on to next section where we will show you how to delete the primary key constant using object explorer and same thing we will do through the project sql and this will be the last demo this series of demo will be the last demo now let's close this and here we will show you how to delete a primary key constant using the object explorer this is the primary key constant it has an associated index defined and it is defined on the customer id column now in the object explorer first we need to expand the table that contains the primary key then we need to expand the keys section which is already expanded we need to right click on the key and select delete this is the way to delete the primary key constant from the object explorer so let's do okay the primary key constant is being deleted all right now it's deleted we see that uh, key column is now does not contain anything let's refresh the indexes section so the associated index is also removed and if we refresh the column section we see that uh, primary key is now removed from the customer id column now let me show you how you can delete a primary key using the table designer that one we had already shown it to you so let's use the test one table let's see if we have any we have a primary key defined on the c2 column so let's open up this table in the design view on the right hand side so we have a primary key defined on the c2 column so in order to remove that uh, primary key what you need to do is uh, you need to right click on the row with the primary key and choose the remove primary key button to toggle the setting from on to off and uh, you need to save this file so now the primary key is removed from the c2 column you can close the designer view and refresh the column section you will see that primary key is now removed from the c2 column so this is the way you can delete a primary key from the table designer view now let me show you how you can delete a primary key constant using the transact sql statements now let me trigger a new query against the my adventure works database so the table which we will use is uh, here is the transaction history archive which we used earlier so it's production dot let's use the but here we don't have any uh, constraint defined as of now so we don't we don't have any constraint under the keys so we will use the transaction history archive table it has a constraint under the keys column so we will try to remove that constraint so i have triggered a new query against this uh, database adventure works 2022 let's uh, write a query let's select the name of the constraints from the system catalog view so the system catalog view is the sys dot uh, key constraints all right and we can specify the filtering criteria where type will be type should be the primary key we can define it by this and let's specify another uh, constraint where let's take the object name uh, function to get the object name and inside that uh, let's specify parent object id and let's specify the name as the transaction history archive table so this will return all the constraints defined on the transaction history archive table let's execute this statement to see what data we are getting so we got the constraint defined on the transaction history archive table this is the name of the constraint so this is the system system catalog view that you can query to along with the object name function to get the constraint defined on any particular table now let's see how you can delete these constraints so the first query was to just view the constraint defined on a particular table now we are actually altering the table to remove the constraint so we are altering the table production dot uh, transaction history archive so after altering the table you can use the drop constraint table to remove any constraint so drop constraint get the name of the constraint from here 
give it under the quotes or even quotes are not required just specify the name of the constraint yeah this much statement is enough so we are entering a table we are dropping our constraint this particular constraint over here so let's execute this statement so the constraint is dropped and we, if we run the above statement it will not give us anything and if we refresh the keys section over here, we can see the keys, uh, this key will get removed. Refresh the section. So key is now removed and uh, none of the columns are having a primary key constraint now available. So this is the way to delete a primary key constraint, primary key constraint using the transact SQL statement. So guys, I hope you like the theoretical stuff of this video along with the practicals. We have uh, covered around uh, seven demos uh, where we have shown you how you can uh, create and delete the primary key constraints using the sql server management studio and uh, using the transact sql statements as well so i hope you like this video if you really like this video please click on the like button below this video and uh, once you hit the like button there is a subscribe button near to that like button click on the subscribe button it will give you a bell icon click on that bell icon select all notifications to get notifications regarding all my future videos so let me give you five seconds please go ahead and uh, subscribe right away so guys i hope you must have subscribed by now so in case you have subscribed please do post in your comments feedbacks and suggestions any requests as well we love to hear from you and uh, we'll we will try to prepare our content accordingly and guys if you have good network of friends and if they are working in sql server domain please ask them to subscribe to our channel if you feel that my content is useful for them and uh, you may ask your friends to subscribe to my channel and if you want to share any of my videos with them you can do so by using the share button which is coming below this video if you want to share this video there's a share button below this video through which you can share this video with your friends on any of the social media platforms i thank you so much for your time on this video today guys and uh, you have a wonderful day thank you so much